Welcome to the Pinch to Zoom podcast. I'm Stetson. I'm Gabe. And in this episode, we're talking audio, or we're listening to audio, or we're doing a little bit of both, quite honestly. No, we're, well, I mean, we're, we actually are talking audio, because that's what we're talking, talking is. But what is audio? All that right. kind of gets, I mean, that's gets, that gets ahead a little bit. We'll yeah, get to that. Okay, I won't go into that now, but we'll get to that eventually. Uh, we're going to be also doing a fun, this is the first time we're doing a pre-recorded kind of segment thing where I took five different microphones, you know, and recorded some audio on them. And Stetson's going to try to guess which microphone type I recorded, you know, which bit on. So, yeah, you can play along at home with that. That will be coming up later in the podcast. Uh, but first, you know what it is, Stetson. Oh, of course I know, Gabe. It's time for, for quick, news. Quick, news, quick, quick, quick news. Quick news, quick news, quick news, quick news, quick news. All right, what do we have first today, Stetson? Uh, first up today, Gabe, we are actually building our own city. And you may think, huh, Stetson, that's a little weird, a little Wait, ambitious. We are building our own We're city? We're building an, our own city. Actually, this is Toyota. So Toyota, they're building their own futuristic city in Japan. It's going to be called the Woven City, located at the base of Mount Fuji, occupying 175 acres of space. And the idea here is to really imagine what a futuristic city could look like built from the ground up uh, with total control over the infrastructure and the facilities and how everything is interwoven together. Uh, Toyota is claiming it will be powered by hydrogen fuel cells. There will be uh, driverless cars, new kinds of transportation systems, and they can really test basically uh, what we're doing now, but in a more controlled, hopefully safer environment. And, and that's what this city is all about. It's about what the future of cities and workplaces and uh, I guess just what life could be like in the future. That does sound pretty cool. It uh, reminds me of, I know, I don't know if it's actually in existence now, but in the UAE, there was this planned city, I think called like Masadar City or something. And it was, yeah, basically, I mean, the UAE has tons of oil money, so they can just basically spend whatever they want. And they had designed this whole city uh, that from the ground up, you know, it used like innovative ways to funnel the wind through areas that would cool it during the uh, like the heat time of the day. Uh, you know, solar panels on buildings, automated transportation. So yeah, that often is how you have to really showcase technology is built from the ground up because otherwise it's kind of retrofitting uh, and also it's a place where people actually live. So you don't want to just change everything overnight. Right. It is kind of a hack job if you are retrofitting older buildings and older components. And I think building it from the ground up just allows so much more integration, so much more thought, and hopefully a cooler final product. And this will be a, a real city. There are supposed to be about 2,000 residents. There will be police, fire. Wait, how, and do, how, do, how do I get to... Can I get on that list of like living there? I think they, I think Toyota has already sold out their living apartments and I think oh. they're going to be uh, housing Toyota employees along with some other people um, and they'll even be schools. So it'll, it'll be a, a full functioning city. I think they're hmm. starting construction in 2021. So I, I feel like I can find a way to get into that city. I don't do know you want, how. I mean, do you want to go to the base of Mount Fuji? Is that your your new destination? I mean, have you seen pictures of Mount Fuji? I it's, I think probably. It's pretty gorgeous, especially when they have the cherry blossoms blooming on the trees. Oh man. It could really be really beautiful. Well, but. actually, get, you know, speaking of something else futuristic is shopping. People do a lot of shopping. I know I do a lot of online shopping. I know you do a lot of online shopping. And this kind of brings us to Amazon. Have you heard of what they're doing? What Amazon is trying to do? I mean, I heard of uh, Jeff Bezos making a six hundred ninety thousand uh, dollar donation to the Amazon wildfires, which is equivalent to a million dollars in Australia uh, in their currency. But that, uh, you know, I just they were getting a lot of like negative feedback on that, and that's rightly so because they've you know cut the like I don't know through all the loopholes and stuff. They pay so low in taxes in Australia and other countries. And six hundred ninety thousand dollars, just to put it in perspective, is if uh, you know Amazon, whatever their net worth is, if you had fifty thousand dollars, if that was your net worth, that would be the equivalent of giving three cents. That is just shockingly low. 
Yes. So that uh, it's just come on, Jeff Bezos. Like you can do better than that. But it almost anyways, be let's they talk about taxes. how they're reinventing the future of shopping now. Yeah. So you may have heard of their Amazon store. This is where you could basically go in. There would be no cash registers, no cashiers. Pick out your items and cameras in the ceiling would track your movement, figure out what you purchased, and then charge your Amazon account at checkout. You would just scan your phone. Now, Amazon is working with Visa and is in talks with MasterCard to develop a biometric payment system where you would check out using just the palm of your hand. So you would have a device, instead of scanning your fingerprint, you would scan basically your entire palm, and that would be your unique identification. Amazon would know it would be you, and it would authorize the payment. And the whole idea here behind this store is to basically build a frictionless shopping experience. Amazon wants to make it as easy as possible for them to get your money and for you to get the items you need. So that's kind of a a cool glimpse into the wild future Amazon is dreaming up. Of course, this could be way off in the future, but it's something that is in development. I think we should have a consumer, like I know there's a consumer protection agency, but one of the things that, that they should be doing, I think, is trying to add friction into shopping experiences because that's actually how you protect the consumer. Like, I know it's all about, oh, you know, ease of use. Yes, like really nice experiences. And that's all cool in theory, but in practicality, I mean, we're like our animal brain just goes into overdrive when we're shopping and when we're, you know, consuming stuff. So put as much friction as possible there, you know, make us solve a math puzzle every time we check out, make us like face our greatest fear. It's like the, uh, the alarm clock, right? You can only turn it off after you solve the math problem. Like what if you had to do that when you went shopping? Yeah, that, that, that might be, maybe that would be. The thing that would catch on, you pay a subscription service to the site and they do that for you. Unfortunately, so. it would decline sales, which would hurt the bottom line, hurt revenue. No, but You'd I'm, go saying, out of business. I'm saying they have a subscription service so you can, you know that you're saving money by employing this because it's going to slow you down from, you know, making purchases, uh, but they're still t- getting some extra money from you. So that's the motto. You charge money to advertise that you'll save money mm-hmm. by preventing people from shopping for things they don't need. Yeah. Well, all right. Uh, we'll save that for the future. All right. Uh, Gabe, we have some other, uh, some more news about actually one of your favorite uh, social media platforms. Yeah, this new... is something I think this is honestly, you know, even was it Spiegel or Spiegel? I'm going to say Spiegel. Evan okay. Spiegel. Yeah, he's the uh, creator and uh, I guess owner of or CEO of uh, Snapchat. The, and the yellow ghost that lives on your home screen of your phone. Yes, or uh, doesn't live if you've you know deleted it, possibly. But uh, he just says that uh, said or predicted that TikTok will overtake Instagram. That's uh, a bold prediction, Gabe. And you what, know, I think what do you he think said this, this because I did it as one of our not sponsored segments. And I'm guessing right after that, the amount of users that TikTok had just skyrocketed. Probably they surged. And also, thank you to everyone who used our fake affiliate link. I just want to—that was amazing. We just got so much kickback from that; it was unreal, incredible. But I, you know, I agree with this uh, prediction or this statement because, you know, Instagram definitely. I don't know if it'll, okay. I don't know if it'll overtake Instagram because Instagram, you know, is very multifaceted. You know, you have the stories aspect. You have even the IGTV aspect for longer form video, and then you have your regular feed. So not sure if it's going to overtake it that way, but maybe in like, you know, amount of time spent on app, you know, or stuff, you know, some certain metrics or active users, TikTok could possibly overtake Instagram. Uh, It's not as friendly for brands potentially because it's a little harder, you know, it's all about memes and stuff like that. But for users, I think that's, really the draw is that it's not as many brands it's more connecting to individual people yeah i think one of the interesting uh things that spiegel pointed out is that um it's about talent-based content as opposed to status-based content i feel like with instagram you get these uh kind of wealthier influencers who are able to go on extravagant adventures go to exquisite foreign locations get the pictures that people literally cannot afford to get, and then they're posting status-based content about their high-end adventures, their high-end cars, 
high-end items. Whereas on TikTok, it's all about talent and uh, what you can do to show off uh, your natural ability. So really, I would I would say though there is definitely that aspect of TikTok that you know has I guess crept over from Instagram of you know someone waking up like in some gorgeous you know uh, apartment in like Dubai or you know uh, I don't know London and like walking through the and looking out the window or you know a, an incredible like uh, remote cabin in Sweden and like sitting in a hot tub so that's definitely some of that has come in or people with like really awesome you know expensive cars that as well so yeah I, I think you're gonna see part of that but I guess you he is true that you know um, the majority of TikTok is you know these tr- dance trends or you know maybe trick shots cool filming tricks stuff that really I mean most of the people are filming it on their cell phones so it's not really about being you know super experienced or being able to get to great areas with great gear it's really about being inventive having some skills and having fun i think tiktok is still really finding its user base and finding its creators and they definitely have a lot more creators as it was the second most downloaded app in the world in 2019 second only to whatsapp so it's it's got some growth for sure and you know we'll have to to wait and see where it goes i'm not on tiktok gabe you're on tiktok yep tiktok at digital tech reviews right now you can check me out but it's stetson you gotta get on there i'm telling you gabe i don't know if i need to get on there in fact i'm thinking i need to actually use my phone less and google might have me covered for this because our next quick news item is google coming out with three new apps to actually help you use your phone less. Gabe, did you see these? Were you able to take this, a look at Well, this at... seems... Why is Google doing this? Don't they make phones? Well, I think actually this appeals to consumers because consumers want to buy a phone from a company that is being mindful and advocating for the consumer. Like Google wants you to have a well-balanced life or Google wants you to think that they exactly. want you to have a well-balanced we life. Um, but anyway, so... Three three new apps, three new products. Uh, should we just dive dive into this? I actually got one of them. Yeah, the first. I mean, the the first two are kind of the same. I think basically, there's one called Screen Stopwatch, and there's another one called Activity Bubbles. Basically, Screen Stopwatch just puts you know a live clock on your phone uh, that lets you know how long you've been using it each day. Essentially, like uh, what is it? It's screen time. But yes. visualized in live format as Which, you use yeah, your phone. and just more visible rather than having to dive deep into settings or something like that. Right. Instead of getting your weekly report where you're like, oh shoot, I spent six hours a day on Instagram. That's a lot. It's like you see it as it's happening. Right in the now, yeah. So hopefully you can see it, act on it. Same thing with their other one, activity bubbles. This one's actually kind of cooler though. Uh, it's a live at wallpaper and it's gonna drop down a little bubble that gets bigger every time you unlock your phone. So, you know, if you unlock it like 5,000 times in a day, probably going to blow up your phone because it's going to get so big, that bubble. Well, okay, but, actually, I actually got the wallpaper and here's, right, here's how it works. A, You're a live on-air audio reaction. So this is what happens. Every time you turn your phone on, a bubble drops down. And the size of the bubble depends on how long you used your phone last time. So if you wake up in the morning and you spend 30 minutes on your phone, then, you know, nothing really happens. The next time you open your phone, a huge bubble representing that 30-minute usage will come down and land on your home screen. So if you do a lot of quick checks, you're going to end up with a lot of small bubbles. But if you do a lot of longer use sessions, then you'll end up with a lot of larger bubbles. And it's kind of like the clock. It's just a more mindful way of how many times you pick up your phone, how many times you look at your phone, how long you're using your phone for, and it's just trying to get you to be more mindful and aware of your phone usage behavior. I like this one better, though, I think, than the stopwatch. It, I, seems, it seems really cool and innovative and not in your face screaming, this is how you know, much you've used it or such, but just kind of it's a way to visualize it. I, I also agree. And, and I think they're both good steps in, in terms of like, uh, I think bringing more awareness to your phone usage. And Gabe, what is the last one? This I'll one let, is. I'll let you take this one because this one right. honestly blows my mind. Okay, so let me just describe this for people. Take your classic. Well, what's it called first? Okay, yeah. What is this called? It's called envelope. That's what it's called. It's called envelope. 
And what you do is to imagine this product, take an actual letter envelope, okay? And slide your phone into it. Go ahead. It's okay. It's not going to hurt. And then seal it up. And then just imagine the envelope kind of suctions down to be conform to the actual dimensions of your phone. So your phone is inside this envelope. You can feel it. You can access the buttons, but the screen is covered and the back is covered. You gotta cut out for your camera. And that is basically, <laughs> this is an actual product. It's called envelope. And you literally put your phone in this envelope and you're not allowed to, to use it essentially, except for core features. So there's little uh, text circles printed on the outside of the envelope over the touchscreen area. And you can use those to take a photo, take a video, or get access to but you a... you can't see what you're taking a photo or video of, really. That's correct. So you basically have to turn the phone on, hope that it's on, and then you would touch the screen through the envelope, and you, you get literally only a either a number dial pad or a camera control feature. And, and that's it. Wow. That's the whole envelope. This is, this is kind of like an e-ink display, I'd say, almost. It does look like an e-ink display, but it's just printed on the envelope, and you get a little bit of backlight from the OLED so it's display just underneath. An, it's just an ink display, I guess. It's <laughs> Yeah, it's an ink awesome. display. Um, wow. Well, and, this is... I mean, it's... Hey, it's better than nothing, but this seems... I uh, This seems something like some Google dev had this idea... And, you know, that whatever they give them, like 20% of their work time is free time for them to work on random projects. This seems like this pro this came out of that time because it's kind of an off the wall idea. But maybe it, I think it would lead to something, you know, more interesting or innovative. Sure. I'd believe that I'd I'd almost want to say like a, a more robust case because this envelope does seal. And the goal is basically to use your phone as little as possible. And then when you open your envelope, it'll tell you how long your phone was in the envelope for and give you some other stats. But yeah, it's it's kind of a throwaway product in my mind just because it's a one-time use. It it doesn't really seem like I don't know anyone who would really buy this more than just to do a review of it. But the other app just carry useful. around your phone in an envelope. <laughs> yeah. No drop protection. That's kind of a big yeah. con. Yeah. All right, that's that's what I have for quick news. Those are um those are yeah, some well, of the announcements. Well, we have to, I mean we have the little bit of this is kind of quick news. Uh it's but it's it's our also our segue into our audio part of our episode. It's uh, the new gear that was released at NAM uh, this past week. Yeah, Gabe. So what what is NAM for our audience members? Okay, NAM. It's N A M M. It's the National Association of Music Merchants. And okay. Basically, it's a trade show. You know how CES uh, is for all consumer electronics. NAB is for National National Association of Broadcasters. This is just for, you know, companies that specialize in either, you know, music recording software, gear, audio recording, you know, in that area uh, you'd find for podcasters, studios, musicians, stuff like that. And it takes pl place every like January in uh, Anaheim. So obviously it happened this past week. That's why we're talking about it. That's a great summary. I feel like I can understand what the conference is about. Uh, so what were what were some of the highlights? What are things you want to talk about that you saw at NAM uh, just this past week? Uh, I mean, there was a bunch of stuff in you know for musicians. Uh, I've recorded a little music, so some stuff I was interested in. But honestly, we don't really talk about much of it. We kind of focus more on audio uh, and video creator stuff. So first thing, um, speaking of audio, uh, Mackie, uh, they're known for really creating speakers that are good for live performances, uh, even some headphones that are decently priced for uh, like studio use, they actually jumped into the microphone game. Which... Whoa. So they just started making microphones kind of out of the blue. Did they have microphones before? No, no, no microphones before. I, I mean, I would have assumed that they did, but apparently not. So uh, first off, they, you know, they have three new mics. One's kind of a microphone that you'd see someone like using for live performances on stage. They have another one coming out. Uh, that's the EM USB condenser mic, uh, and that's obviously uh, for you know like plug and play simplicity. It's going to be more for your streamers, uh, you know, podcasters that are just starting out, and even some video creators who don't want to deal with the complexity of an XLR uh, setup. And that one's going to be one hundred and forty nine dollars, so a little bit expensive. Uh, and then the other one uh, is the EM ninety one C. Uh, and this is an XLR microphone uh, intended also kind of like the ones that we're using to record this podcast on, 
uh, you know, for voiceovers and stuff like that. And this one's only $79, though, so very affordable. It sounds like they have competitive prices, but honestly, for a company to have no microphone products and then to just make their own microphones, I feel like that's a bold move. The audio industry has been moving kind of slowly, in my opinion. Like, audio tech hasn't really changed that much in quite a long time, to be honest. Um, I mean, there have been some improvements here and there, but a lot of the core features are the same. And I feel like audio brands like Rode or Sennheiser are already really established in providing the premium high-end products people are used to. So for Mackie to come in and make their own microphones, I think it's bold. I think people are really going to need to test them out um, and Mackie's going to need to earn their trust. What do you think? Well, the interesting thing is, and I was going to save this for when we were talking about microphones later in the segment or in this episode, but you know, microphones are essentially just the reverse of headphones and speakers. Yeah, a speaker is a microphone and a microphone is a speaker. This is true. Yeah, it's just based on, you know, a microphone is absorbing sound and, you know, converting it to electrical current, and a speaker is taking an electrical current and converting it to uh, sound, which is like airwaves. So So you think Mackie can take their speaker engineering expertise and basically make good microphones from it? Yeah, I I would predict that these are I mean, I wouldn't say they're maybe like the best microphones out there, but it's nice that they're starting uh, with cheaper, more inexpensive microphones. uh, And it looks like they'll probably work their way up maybe uh, to more professional ones. Sure. So cheaper mics, new options for people to consider and try out. What other products do we see at NAMM, NAM, NAM? Uh, The other thing we saw uh, with another microphone is AKG, uh, known also again for their headphones. They released a multi-pattern USB condenser mic that's going for $149. And the interesting thing about this one, A, it has kind of a nice retro look, which, you know, I always like mics that have, you know, a really, you know, unique uh, design because it's good marketing for one, because if a streamer has it on their desk or some creator has it in a picture, it's the type of microphone that, you know, someone's going to see and be like, oh, you know, if they ever go to get a mic, they're like, you got to get this one, and they'll be easy to identify which one it is uh, and then purchase it. So Yeah, I almost want to say the opposite is true for, I think it's Blue Yeti or Yeti. I don't, is the company Blue in the microphone Yeti? Yeah, yep, yeah, the yep, company's okay. Blue. And they have like this modern, sleek looking uh, microphone that sits on your desk. This is almost like a retro style Blue Yeti. And I, I think, well, well, Blue, their microphones all do look pretty unique, even the Yeti. You know, while it looks very modern and stuff, they have some very cool color designs for it. Uh, But they also have microphones like the Baby Bottle um, and a couple other ones. I think the Icicle, they all have like very modern designs, but they're also still unique. Not like, you know, they're not just like an all matte black microphone that could, you know, you couldn't pick out of any brand. You know, if you did a police lineup, which microphone killed your uh, your friend? You wouldn't be able to pick out. (laughs) Which one made your ears bleed? They all sound the same. Exactly. Yeah. So this uh, this AKG Lyra uh, USB mic, the cool thing about it is it actually has um, four, uh, I guess, a four capsule array. So basically where your standard microphone will just have one capsule, like one thing to pick up the sound and convert it to an electrical current. This one actually has four so that you can switch from just a standard pickup pattern to potentially having, you know, a two pickup pattern, like pickup in front and behind for if you're doing like one microphone in the, on a table with two people. Uh, and then it can even adjust from a wider pickup pattern uh, to more narrow, all just because it has uh, these four different arrays of, uh, you know, capsules that it can use to adjust and, you know, sample where sound is coming from. Yeah, I would assume it would actually just kind of turn on or off the different capsules based on kind of which area you wanted to, to focus your audio on. That's really cool and could be great for doing sit down interviews in, in terms of having two people and one microphone that kind of set up. Yeah, and well, it's not it's actually not really. I don't know. I don't know exactly the technology they're using, but I'm going to guess that it's not only turning on and off, but it's also canceling out a little bit, too. So you know, if you want to just pick up from the front, it's going to listen to what's coming in the back and actually uh, do the reverse of that signal as well and take that signal out of what's being picked up from the front capsule potentially. Yeah, I actually really like the look of this. I love the the retro style and it, it kind of does seem like a, a great microphone. And 
I, I kind of wish I had a need for it, but I honestly do not to any capacity. Yeah, definitely, definitely aimed at, you know, your beginners uh, because of that USB plug and play simplicity, uh, which speaking of which, we actually have a lot like a exclusive leak. Yeah, Gabe, um, what what is going on here? What is happening? This is, this is pretty crazy. So uh, I was going through uh, earlier today trying to find, you know, some new audio gear that came out, you know, looking through B&H on their Explorer page. And I saw, oh, the Rode uh, NT USB Mini. Oh, cool! This is, you know, obviously a mini version of their NT USB microphone, and you know, it's cheaper at ninety nine dollars. I was reading through it. I was like, great, put it in our notes for the show, uh, and then went to go back and check on it uh, right before we were recording, and it's gone. And it looks like that page is no longer in existence. And I'm guessing it's because BNH jumped the gun and scheduled this uh you know post to be published a little earlier than road was planning on releasing the microphone so if you're listening to this uh potentially you just got an exclusive uh you know sneak peek at a microphone that isn't going to be out potentially i don't know i'm I, i'm don't know, guessing but soon soon right Hopefully yeah soon. soon i'm guessing if i'm thinking it was published on the like the 20th so maybe they meant february 20th so maybe it's a whole month or it could have just been like a couple of days type thing Sure, like a week sure. in advance. Hard to say. If you've been looking at the regular Rode NT USB mic, maybe hold off. Wait and see what the Mini has to offer at a cheaper price point. Yeah. Uh, and finally, the last thing that we saw from the NAM conference is we're kind of getting deep in gear here. This is, you know, people are like, all right, this is this is too much. I, you know, I don't even know what mics do now. Uh, uh, the final thing is we got a audio interface and recorder from zoom now okay they're they make i actually use i'm using their zoom h5 right now so they announced a new audio interface and a new recorder these are two separate products uh no it's it's the same thing it's a digital mixer and multi-track recorder basically you know you see those videos of people in studios with those huge boards sliding up and down all those knobs and levers this is basically a smaller version of that it has eight channels, so it has eight, you know, knobs and levers to slide up and down. Uh, it can record in from, I think, uh, I'm not sure how many XLR sources, but okay, six here it is, six XLR sources. Uh, it has four uh, headphone outputs and can also do a phone input in. So if you're using it for a podcast, for example, we could have someone call in and record that right into our podcast. And it even has uh, some things to launch sound effects. So yeah, this is definitely targeted not only at musicians starting out, uh, you know, and wanting a cheap on the go alternative for recording, but also because of the explosion we've seen in podcasts recently, uh, targeted at podcast creators uh, and people creating a podcast studio. And for $399, this is not only cheaper uh, than the road, I think podcaster or roadcaster, but it's also cheaper than the new task cam um 12 channel mix, mixer we saw from them which was also uh six hundred dollars so Ooh, yeah. i think i'm sensing some upgrades in our podcast gear in the future potentially though it's not really helpful to have one of these if we're on either sides of the united states so this is true we may need to work on that uh yeah. so maybe get that first and then we'll have to do something about our or location. what about if we get it cut it in half oh see and... now we're talking gabe i like that creativity yeah We'll, we'll, we'll circle back to that after the episode. But now let's get into the main part of the episode, talking about microphones, uh, talking about audio, uh, and giving you a better idea not only of how microphones work, but potentially what microphone works best for you. Yeah, the best. I mean, this is something when you're starting out on YouTube or any platform, really. Audio is so important, and you want to pick the best microphone uh, to suit your needs and to get the best audio quality uh, while also having the flexibility you need. So we'll be covering, like Gabe mentioned, how microphones work and then the different kinds of microphones, some of the microphones we use, and uh, some recommendations for you to pick the best mic to meet your needs. Yeah. Uh, Stetson, so what's your experience with microphones first off? just Well, it's it's pretty minimal, to be honest. You know, of course, you you grab a camera to go make YouTube videos. And I actually started out on my iPhone and then I got... A little mic that just plugged into the headphone jack on the iPhone. Shout out to iPhone 5 that had the headphone jack. And then from there, got a camera. And of course, the built-in microphone on the camera was absolute garbage. Um, And uh, of course, jumped on the... I actually got the 
Sure. Um, I forget what it's called. The it's the Sure Lens Hopper ninety three. I think. I think something like that. But I got you know this your is shotgun the on camera mic, right? Yeah, it's a it's a it mounts on the hot shoe of your camera, and it just has that negative twenty decibel or the plus twenty, excuse me, decibel gain. Um, and it just helps increase the audio quality. And that's that's kind of my foray into the audio world. I was kind of looking at what other people were doing and uh, just trying to record audio with my video and make it sound at least a little bit better. Now I feel like after researching for this podcast, I know so much more and would make so many different decisions. Uh, but that's kind of how I, I, I started off and, and got into audio. Gabe, it, it sounds like you've actually done, I want to say like almost some musical performances and and much more with audio. In fact, you edit this podcast, which I really respect. I have absolutely no idea how to use Logic and, and all of that. So yeah, what, I just how, have to, I have how to did cut you out, get into it? I have to cut out so much of what you're saying all the time too. So that takes me forever. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I mean, I started out... Uh, it, with music, a lot of times, you know, I started recording, you know, of course, you can record pretty much all musical instruments just by playing in on a keyboard. So you don't really need to record that with a microphone. But for singing or rapping, stuff like that, yeah, you'd still need a mic. So that's how I got started with audio, uh, you know, creating my own little studio at home, basically by going into a closet, and, because it would deaden the sound and taking like a $40 Radio Shack mic, plugging it into a computer and recording right into GarageBand. And that works, you know, basically it's, you're like, all right, this works for now. But then you start realizing, all right, you know, maybe I could upgrade the mic. Uh, went to a more expensive USB mic. Then I went to an XLR mic. So I had to get an audio interface, which would convert that XLR signal into a USB for my computer. And from there, yeah, then I went into the video area and kind of have progressed in that general fashion. Uh, and also in college, I took a couple audio classes, which were fun to learn about kind of how uh, sound works, how microphones work, and yeah, basically kind of what we're going to talk about. Uh, yeah, I mean, a that's, a, that's a great segue. So you're in this audio class, you're learning how microphones work. Gabe, how do microphones work? We already touched on that microphones and speakers are basically the same. How, like, what is the basic fundamentals of this technology right now? I mean, because my voice is going into this microphone and then coming out of our listener speaker, whether it's a car or a headphone or maybe a smart speaker, what is going on? So it's, it's I mean, if you think about it, it's actually kind of a magical thing. Uh, and it's all thanks to what we call transducers, which convert, you know, the sound waves into an electrical current. You know, then that's stored as a digital file in your computer or on your cell phone. Uh, and then when you play it, it's converted again using your speakers, which are also a transducer, uh, back into sound waves uh, so that your ears can hear our beautiful voices. Yeah, so basically everything is a transducer. And I guess to outline this in a simple workflow, you have your voice, which is creating pressure waves in the air. This is picked up by the transducer, the microphone, and it is typically recorded at what's called mic level, which is super, super quiet. So that signal, which has now been converted from pressure waves into a electrical signal, it's converted through a preamp to make it louder or called line level. And then that is then going into your recorder or audio interface so you can edit and manipulate the file. Um, and then that audio signal, that electrical signal is then piped out through your speakers. And you can hear, as Gabe mentioned, our beautiful voices or just Gabe's voice if he cuts mine out again. Yeah, uh, this is just the Gabe podcast now, so they're not going to hear you at all. But yeah, you are exactly right, though, and that is uh, a conventional setup. You know, we're talking about a studio. It's different, uh, you know, for example, on an iPhone when you're recording audio, just, you know, if you're shooting video, it's basically, you know, your microphone's right in your uh, smartphone. So, for example, the, you know, the audio wave is going to hit your cameras i think the iphone has three microphones right or something they, like that. they actually have a, a pretty robust array i think it is yeah. three one of them's like primary the other two cancel stuff out and yeah in this case like the mic and the preamp are built in and i guess yeah, the recorder, and they're like, all they're all digital basically so it's you know it's going right from the sound in the microphone right to a digital uh current which is then you know essentially already digital so they don't really need like a preamp and stuff that's all digital stuff that's, you know, they're just going to boost the signal digitally, uh, compressor, you know, different EQing and stuff, and then going to record it. So, but 
the question now we have is, okay, so that's all fine and good that these sound waves are hitting the microphone, but what are they actually hitting and what uh, does that do that then converts it into an electrical current? Yeah, so I guess what it's hitting is the transducer. And yeah. from my understanding, there are three main types. Well, there's basic. Well, there's basically two, I'd say. Yeah. All right. Uh, there's there's basically two. That's a, that's a good clarification. Um, and and you'll see these you, if you've ever gone microphone shopping online and stuff. You'll probably see these two words: condenser or capacitor mic, and then a dynamic microphone. So, Gabe, and, what 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 are those? What are the differences between the dynamic and the condenser? Yeah. So it's. I mean, they sound very confusing. And they kind of are really confusing because they're not very self-explanatory. But basically, a dynamic microphone, uh, think of, you know, those flashlights you had as a kid that you'd shake up and they'd kind of charge by passing the magnetic coil back and forth over like uh, copper wire. And okay. Charge up the battery. Yeah. Have yeah, you ever yeah. seen so one of those? The, the wire over the, the shaking would charge it up and it would make the electrical yeah. current and that's that would turn the flashlight on. It's based off the, you know, the uh, the physics property of passing a magnet over uh, like a coiled copper wire generates actually an electrical current. And so, so this is so how your dynamic microphone works, basically. So it's basically you have almost, I want to say like a drum and the drum will vibrate and the vibration will move the magnet over coils of wire that will then just turn the vibrations essentially into an electrical current. And that's our dynamic microphone. Yeah, as as that drum moves over the uh, the coils, you know, based on how loud you are, are talking or the the frequency of your voice, yeah, that it's gonna it's I mean it's we're talking like very fine, uh, you know, you know, like it's very precisely engineered thing, so that even like the smallest little frequency will move it a little bit. But that's yeah, that's how a dynamic microphone work. Uh, condenser microphone, which they also I said earlier was called the capacitor microphone uses a capacitor, which is basically two plates, uh, very small, you know, metal plates that are close to each other or laying near each other in some way that have, you know, one as a negative current, one as a positive current. And when those plates are pushed closer to each other, that current actually gets higher. Uh, and when they're pulled further apart, they get lower. So what happens is when you, when you, when we're speaking right now, cause we're both actually using condenser microphones, uh, when we speak into it, our you know our voices the sound waves hit the little diaphragm and pushes those plates a little closer or further apart uh and that makes a frequency turning into an electrical signal yeah so both the dynamic and condenser methods are taking pressure waves and turning them into electrical signals that are sound yep uh and essentially the you know use of or the you know the pros and cons of each of these types of microphones is you'd get a dynamic microphone or com commonly used on radio shows or really the m the most common use is live performances so because like if you go to a, a festival or a concert or something that's yeah that would be like live. if you've been ever handed a mic at a like a karaoke bar most likely that's a dynamic microphone interesting why why would they use dynamic for live performances uh they're very durable is the main thing you know so you can drop them on stage you know, they can, you know, traveling on a road trip, you know, across the country, you know, they're not going to have to worry about any issues. Uh, and beyond being durable, they're not as delicate, like, th yeah, they're not as delicate, but they're not as, um, I guess, the you know, just not as fine in how, like, precise they are with the audio. So you can kind of be, you know, not as exact with your, you know, miking techniques. You know, it's not going to matter if you're three inches away from your face versus five. You know, they're, they're not... Uh, they're not as good, essentially, as, uh, you know, a condenser microphone, but that's actually a benefit when, you know, you're not using them in a proper environment, potentially. I've heard dynamic microphones uh, have pretty good, I want to say, like, off-axis rejection, where basically the performer will hold the dynamic microphone, and you'll hear their voice, and it will not pick up the, like, screaming crowd in the background. So that that is something that I've, I've read is a, a perk or benefit of using those uh, but I think that also kind of relates more to the pickup pattern, um, yeah, a than, little bit than the the microphone itself. Right. But it is it is definitely um, an advantage to dynamics. So then, what what are condenser microphones used for? You, you mentioned they're a little bit more precise, they're finer, uh, they're using I I, I want to say higher 
not really higher quality, but more carefully crafted materials to produce sound. What are the benefits of that? Well, they actually, I, I forgot one more uh, benefit of the dynamic microphone is it actually doesn't require power. Oh, uh, that is a know. huge benefit. So, so it, our, our, our condenser microphones like we're using now actually require 48 volt phantom power uh, to be sent up through the XLR cable. So that, you know, the the plates can be charged and it can measure the difference in the voltage. So that makes sense. So with the dynamic, it's basically off at all times and it produces its own electrical current based on the sound or the audio waves that hit it. Whereas with the condenser microphone, you need that current in order for the microphone to send back the electric signal of the audio. Honestly, we could almost cut out the past five minutes of us explaining and just include that. That was probably the best summary of what these two microphones wow. types are. Uh, you know, it's just, so. it's learning. You remember 90% of what you're teaching, so I'm trying to ingest what you're bestowing upon me and uh, try and communicate it back and what makes sense. So, yeah, all right, I think I got the difference between these two. We talked a lot about the dynamic and the benefits of that. Um, did you mention the benefits of the condenser and why actually we chose to use condenser microphones for this podcast? Yeah, well, condenser microphones are a lot more clear, they, you know, more accurate, better frequency response. So they're actually better microphones in a lot of cases, uh, except for what we talked about for the uses for a dynamic mic. But yeah, for something like this in a studio where we're both sitting at our desks talking, or, you know, if you're uh, recording a voiceover for, you know, whatever video you're creating or, you know, vocals in a studio, that's going to be uh, more useful to use a dynamic i mean a condenser microphone like this uh, like i think we're right now using the nt1 by road and that's a yeah it's a great condenser microphone but i would not want to you know throw this microphone around on stage uh, and i wouldn't want to you know put it in front of drums which are really loud because that could potentially da- damage the diaphragm uh, and the capsule of this microphone right it would break so those those are the two types of microphones dynamic and condenser and um I was also reading there's different kinds of pickup patterns for each of the different kind of microphones. So what what is a pickup pattern and and what are the different options that we have there? I think the best way to kind of get into understanding a pickup pattern is think of like the wide like a wide angle lens, you know, versus a 360 lens versus a zoom lens. Like that's really the best way to kind of understand pickup patterns because essentially if you have a microphone that, for example, has a uh, you know an omnidirectional pickup pattern, that's that's basically like your 360 camera. That's going to pick up sounds from every direction, no matter you know if you're on the back of the microphone, the front of the microphone. Essentially, there is no back or front because wherever you are, it's just going to record that audio. That's a that's a great comparison, actually. Yeah. So the pickup pattern is how well the microphone picks up sound from different directions. And as Gabe mentioned, omnidirectional, so your 360 camera picks up sound equally well from all directions. What's the second kind of pickup pattern? So the second kind is cardioid uh, pickup pattern. And this is actually called that because of a heart. You like your heart, you know, you think cardiac arrest. That's where it gets its name from because the cardioid looks kind of like a heart if you look at it from the it actually top. kind of looks like a butt it looks like two butt cheeks okay well it might <laughs> yeah, look like that it's too. your heart it's like if you made uh uh what is it a less no yeah less than and then a number three to make a heart that little like old style emoji well it, i mean it looks like an actual like if you look at the chambers of the heart from above this is what it actually looks like okay gabe's got because a better basically, explanation that's what it looks like it looks like a heart it's basically like a half circle and then on the other end, it kind of is like the top side of a heart that, you know, is is rounded with that indent in. I right, guess. right. But, but you know, visual explanations aside, because that doesn't go over well on podcasts, as we know, uh, the cardioid pickup pattern is what we're using now on our microphones. And it basically, ha- you know, picks up well from the front, a little bit from the sides, and then rejects most of the stuff in the back so that when we're speaking, you know, into a microphone, you don't really want to hear the echo if there's any echo coming from behind the microphone or if, you know, someone's behind the microphone making some noise. You don't really want to hear that as well. So, yeah, that's what a cardioid uh, pickup pattern is. It's, and it's, it's general- directional. That's yeah, it's, it's directional. directional. Wherever the mic is pointing, that is what is going to be picked up. And where the mic is not pointing, the sides and behind it, 
they're going to be either really quiet or not there at all. Yeah, that's exactly it. And so. there, there are actually subcategories to this as well. So we have different kinds of cardioid pickup patterns, subcardioid, hypercardioid, and supercardioid. And all this the, uh, does, the variances, are how focused uh, the sound is. And sometimes if you get more focused, it'll detect the mic will pick up from both the front and the back. Um, but it, it's really kind of like Gabe mentioned, like with your lens, it's kind of like zooming in on your lens, on your telephoto lens. So if you get closer into your subject, then you're basically going from subcardioid to hypercardioid to supercardioid, just becoming a little bit more focused. That's, that's exactly it. And you might have heard uh, hypercardioid or supercardioid mentioned when you're looking at shotgun microphones. That's the pickup pattern they use, uh, and it's basically yeah. So you can be you know five feet, ten feet away from your subject, and really try to focus that you know that beam of where you're picking up audio right on your subject, rather than picking up everything else around them. Yeah, I think Gabe, we've done a very thorough explanation of audio. Uh, so based on what we've covered, the different types of microphones and the different types of pickup patterns. What specifically are we using for our setup right now? We're using the Rode NT1. What is that? So this is a condenser microphone. It's a large diaphragm. So there's actually three different types of uh, diaphragms. That oh, now we're going to diaphragm bonus segment. Diaphragm. Well, this is this is this is luckily very simple. It's small, medium, large. So they're either using you know it's self-explanatory. It's the size of the diaphragm. These are large diaphragm, which are generally used for stuff like voiceovers and such because of that large diaphragm, it can give a better bass response uh, and has a nice proximity effect for when you're, you know we're up close talking to the microphone. It sounds really nice. And so, yeah, this is a large diaphragm condenser microphone with an XLR output. So, you know, starting through that three prong XLR cable uh, and then it's going into our audio interface and recording the audio into a digital uh, format. And it's got that cardioid pickup pattern. I don't know if you said that. Yeah, I didn't mention that actually, okay, but yes, cool. you are so, correct. So that's it. Um, that's what we're using and we chose to use these kinds of microphones for the podcast because it has that richer bass response it sounds better when we're closer to it and we're in a controlled environment i'm in a studio with uh, acoustic panels that are basically just towels wrapped around wooden frames Um, and gabe is also in his studio and they work well for us but the microphone that could work well for you may be different so we covered all of microphones what are the main types of like when you go out to buy a microphone what are the options like what are you looking at what yeah what are the different kinds so all right so first off you know we we have your standard large diaphragm condenser which is basically going to be any you know desktop usb microphone uh or such you have a lav microphone which is short for lavalier microphone which is if you ever see people on tv you know we have the microphones pinned to their shirt or something. That's a lavalier microphone. Sometimes called a lapel microphone. You are very correct because, yeah, you clip it to a lapel. Uh, and then next you have your shotgun microphone, which I previously mentioned. And that is used for often recording sound on location. So like on a film set, for example, or in TV shows that are recorded like, you know, on a live studio sound stage something like that and usually it's often used with someone holding a boom like a large pole and trying to direct the microphone at that talent so at your actor or whatever but you know it can also be set up uh, if your talent is stationary yeah i mean maybe it's almost it's almost helpful to to visualize this so you're your talent you're on stage you've got your lavalier microphone clipped to your clothing so people can can hear you it's got good sound and then above you is some audio engineer dude he's holding this boom mic and he's trying to point it at you and get good audio as well. And if you totally nerf the whole thing, then you're heading into the studio, you're getting your condenser microphone out, and you're recording a voiceover. I think that, yeah, that's, that those are like the three different kinds of mics and how you would use them. That's pretty much, yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, you, and then you get slight variances on all that. Like, for example, on-camera microphones are oftentimes, you know, basically a shotgun microphone, but, you know, slightly adapted to be smaller and output to a, like a 3.5 millimeter jack so they can go either into your camera or possibly into a smartphone. Uh, and then, you know, then of course, I mean, we go into built-in microphones. That's a whole other thing. But basically we're leaning towards, I actually recorded five different clips of audio 
uh, one using my smartphone, one using my camera, one using a lav microphone, one using a shotgun microphone, and another using a large diaphragm condenser microphone. And I'm going to have you, Stetson, play them back. And it'll, of course, it will play back in the podcast so the audience, you can hear it. And we're going to, you know, you guys are going to try to figure out which one was recorded with which microphone. All right, audience, are you ready for this? Uh, get your listening. Yeah, this, is, this, is a, this is a momentous occasion. First time we're doing some real, like, pre-planned uh, game or pre-recorded audio segment. All right, so audience, it's you and me right now. I have no idea what Gabe has recorded. We have six different audio clips five different we're excuse me thank you gabe we have five different see he lettered them instead of numbering them i lettered them i know i know but <clears throat> it's all right we have so, a through e clips exactly and we're gonna put our ears up and we'll hear the differences i'm gonna try and guess by all means you are welcome to guess with me um and we're gonna see what we get so i'm gonna listen to clip number do we, a right do we want to go uh, you guess as I guess we'll you can kind of guess as you go, and then once you get through all of them, then you can give your final guesses. Is what we'll do. Yeah. All right. Welcome to the Pinch to Zoom podcast. This is just a mic test. Which mic, though? That's for you to decide. Okay. After listening to clip A, I heard a lot of background hiss and background noise. I would associate that typically with a smartphone or lav microphone, um, and I also heard. A little bit of variance from the left and right channels. To me, this would make it seem like it is the smartphone, uh, just because I know the new, or I, I guess now the old, the, the iPhone 10s, which is what you have, uh, does have that stereo audio recording. So if you happen to move it in one direction or another, that would pick up. So I think I'm leaning towards A is the smartphone. Okay, so let's go with uh, Mike Mystery Mike number or letter B. See numbers and letters. Welcome to the Pinch to Zoom podcast. This is just a mic test. Which mic, though? That's for you to decide. This one sounded very clear to me, although I did hear an echo. And to me, that seems characteristic of a shotgun type microphone where it's pointed directly at you, but it's catching the echo of your voice as it's bouncing back across the room. So uh, I think I would lean towards B being the shotgun. That's, that seems like a good guess, but let's head on to uh, Mike Clip, letter C. Welcome to the Pinch to Zoom podcast. This is just a mic test. Which mic, though? That's for you to decide. Oh, God. C was just hot garbage. It was so bad. I, oof. I feel like there was just so much background noise. I feel like I could hear the room environment. I... Mm. All right. I think based on hearing that, I almost want to make I almost want to make C the smartphone just because it was so bad and make the lav mic A because I'm thinking. Remember, there's also a camera mic as well. Oh, 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 those are notorious. Oh, it's definitely, you know, you bring it up. It's got to be the camera. Cameras are notoriously bad. Now that you bring that up, I actually think it could be the camera because typically cameras are farther away from you. And being farther away generally increases the room noise or the environment that is perceived through the audio. So I think smartphone A could have been a little bit closer uh, so you can hear that. And then I think C is probably camera. All right, let's move on to letter D. Welcome to the Pinch to Zoom podcast. This is just a mic test. Which mic though? That's for you to decide. Okay, mic D very clear i i actually really liked the bass response on this one I, it's like almost so clear i could hear the mouth noise it almost sounds like the microphones we're using now so if i were to guess i would lean towards putting b as the large diaphragm because of those characteristics okay that's yeah that's that i mean you it does seem to point towards a large diaphragm microphone so it seems pretty good by the way what do you think of me doing the intro do you think it sounds Sounds better. I think it does, right? For these segments? Yeah. The Welcome to the Pinch to Zoom oh. podcast. I think that's better than you, right? I mean, just saying. No, I don't want to put it out there, but I mean... I, I'm hearing it a lot right now. I'll, I'll let you yeah, know. It's, it's, it sounds sounds better. If we're going no matter with letter what, C, Gabe, it was hot garbage. No matter mo you know what? what microphone I'm using, it sounds better, I think. All right, I'm going to give the last one, Mike E, a test. All right, so this is letter E. Yep. Welcome to the Pinch to Zoom podcast. 
This is just a mic test. Which mic though? That's for you to decide. I could I could see the last one being a lav mic. Uh, what were the what was the last option? That was lav mic. It was their last, the only one you hadn't chosen. Uh oh, sorry. I had okay. Yeah, so that one makes sense. Yeah, I do. Yeah, that was E. Sorry, I had um accidentally put the letter A as the lav as well. But I think okay. Yeah, no, I think you'd switched A to smartphone no yeah i was c when i got hit letter c that's when there was some uncertainty so my i don't know audience what your your list is you can write it out we had smartphone camera lav shotgun and large diaphragm i'm going smartphone a large diaphragm b camera c shotgun microphone d lav mic e that's my that's my final take okay you um first one a was camera mic ah so maybe i switched those you yeah exactly yeah because c was the smartphone Ah, c was Uh, hot garbage smartphone and you were pretty you were pretty close i mean you had like you got them you you picked those two out and basically the only like identifiable difference i would say like listening to them and knowing which is which is the camera mic had a lot of hiss on it which is common with um preamps the preamps are garbage camera mic cameras have pretty terrible built-in preamps and as you said mentioned earlier in this episode that's why a lot of on-camera mics have a plus 20 decibel switch so that you can kind of override those preamps um and the iphone uh clip c that one had a lot of what you're hearing that sound pretty awful was a lot of compression oh a lot of, i yeah. think that's what i thought was like the room noise from the camera exactly. but really i had it the hiss was the preamp in the camera and the room noise which is the garbage compression of the smartphone yeah the compression and the auto gain like the camera yeah. or the the iphone adjusting the levels really quickly uh, just really sounded honestly i thought the iphone would sound a lot better and i'm imagining you could get better audio quality if you use a dedicated recorder app but i just basically used like the voice memo app yeah, I mean, that's what I would do. How did I do for the other microphones? You were pretty good, but uh, you sw- again, I think you switched the large diaphragm and the shotgun microphone. Interesting, interesting. So actually, the shotgun microphone, which I used, um, the new Rode VideoMic NTG, which technically can be used as an on-camera microphone, uh, even a desktop microphone, but is predominantly, like in, in its essence, a shotgun microphone. That's what I used for B. And granted, that was only about three feet away from me, so... That's why you got a little bit more of that bass response. But in a lot of, uh, you know, like film scenes, for example, where they're more intimate and stuff, you will actually be able to get that microphone pretty close to your talent. So that was that was why how I did that. And then the large diaphragm was actually not the one I'm using now. I used another one, the Audio-Technica AT2035, uh, which is, you know, pretty inexpensive, only about 100, I think, 40 bucks, 150 bucks microphone. Uh, but but you did get the lav mic. I got right, so. one out of five. I got twenty. No, but I mean you, you were pretty. You were pretty on uh, for like you. You had identified which were the shotgun and the large diaphragm, and you definitely got the lav mic. And you identified which were the camera and the iPhone. So you, I mean, you were you were definitely honed in in the right areas. But honestly, it's hard to even tell. I could have probably done a little better job in uh, recording them in ways that would help differentiate which was which but for our first audio pre-recorded segment i thought it went pretty well yeah i thought it was it was really interesting uh i think you could have of course said something uh more fascinating (laughs) than this all right okay but no i thought it was i thought it was good and i think to your point my reasoning and logic were sound um but there were some slight subtleties i didn't quite pick up hold on on. that was a good pun i just want to shout you out for that oh wow i didn't even that was that was actually genuinely unintentional that was that, wow. genuinely good too. Bravo! So, wow, yeah, I prop myself up a little bit after getting a twenty percent on that quiz. But yeah, no. Yeah, I, so that I'll, I'll 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 bump your grade actually up to a eighty percent. Oh wow, thanks, Gabe, flipping yeah. that around for me. So, uh, but what this actually really does highlight is how bad uh, built-in microphones are, and the you know the vastly improved audio you can get if you go out and purchase a microphone to either record to an external recorder like the task cam I'm using or your zoom recorder you're using or even just into the camera or your smartphone. That's actually something I wanted to bring up is that 
you know, we still have podcasts today. You're listening to a podcast. So we we still have audio only media formats. We no longer have silent movies. And I think that just goes to show how important audio is. In- well, actually, I would argue that. No, no, I wouldn't really argue that. But I would almost say we do because the amount of people who watch video on their smartphones in places in public where they can't listen to the audio and are forced to either use captions or just watch the video for what it is. I'd say that not not really, but almost jokingly, that does bring back sound. I, I guess I, I'd be hesitant because there are captions. So you're reading it. And that's almost like true. That's almost like a storybook right there. That's how I. Oh, yeah, no, your your point is valid. Uh, yeah, my point being that the audio format is incredibly important for storytelling, and getting high quality audio, in my opinion, is more important than getting high quality video. It's for whatever reason, it's the video garbage video with pristine audio is so much easier to watch than razor sharp 8K video footage with garbage built in microphone audio. Um, And so for your setup, I would definitely recommend uh, considering an audio upgrade over anything else, even just getting some kind of USB microphone and filming with your phone that can make a huge difference in the production quality of your content. Gabe, what what was your first mic? And I guess what would you do differently for building uh, your YouTube mic setup for for what kind of videos you produce? So for videos, I'm trying to think. I think the first microphone I got for videos was an on-camera microphone. I think it was like the Rode video mic, I'm pretty sure. And that was, yeah, this big on-camera microphone. You put a 9-volt battery in it. It has a wind screen or a dead cat. It's kind of like this fluffy thing you put on the mic that cuts the wind. And it was, it was I mean, it was all right. But really, I think on-camera microphones are definitely limited. They're good for, you know, vlogging, for capturing some bass audio, but for if you really want to get, you know, good quality voiceover in your video, you're better off trying to upgrade your whole system and getting either a shotgun microphone, a lav microphone, or really doing it all in post with a voiceover using a large diaphragm condenser uh, at your desktop and like, yeah, just voicing it over that way. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I actually started out the same way. So, uh, the microphone I had mentioned earlier in the podcast, I was really close. It's actually the Shure VP 83 lens hopper camera mount shotgun microphone. And again, basically what I wanted to do was as Gabe mentioned, bypass the garbage preamp built into the camera. And what these shotgun microphones have is a plus 20 decibel gain. So you can turn the mic input up really high and then turn down the input on the camera. And that makes significantly better audio quality. And these are great for vlogging. But I think if I was doing it again, to Gabe's point, I found I spend way more time in a studio recording voiceover uh, and doing that kind of audio work. So I would actually uh, would have preferred to have started with a large cardioid microphone like the Rode NT1 or a shotgun microphone. And Gabe, you had mentioned you were using the Rode, the new Rode NTG for that audio test, right? Yeah, for the uh, shotgun mic one. Yeah, and I loved the bass response of that. I thought it sounded really good. Uh, so one of those could honestly work really well um, in, a, in a very... It's actually, wait, wait a minute. That microphone is so good. It could be a shotgun. It can be an on-camera mounted microphone and used for voiceover. Yeah, so it's, it's actually, I would really, uh, honestly, I hate to plug uh, Rode's new microphone. But Rode, please sponsor us. Yeah, actually, they, they do sponsor podcasts, so hold on a second. No, but... Wait wait a minute, Gabe. What is this email? Oh, no. oh my God, Rode, Hey, how did you get into my emails? I must have forwarded that, sorry. But I've been, I've been testing out this new microphone uh, for the past week or so. It's a $250 microphone, but it's kind of interesting because it's really disrupting the whole idea of with microphones... Essentially, you've, you know, if you wanted an on-camera mic, all right, you just get an on-camera mic, then you're going to have your shotgun. You know, I have, I was able to do that five, uh, you know, mic test because I have so many different microphones because if I want to record a certain type of video, all right, I got to use this microphone. Or if I want to do some music, all right, I need this microphone. But the Rode uh, new microphone, the video mic NTG, potentially is signaling a new future for microphones as it can, as you mentioned, be a shotgun microphone. 
an on-camera microphone as well as potentially a microphone that you could set up on your desktop and record some voiceovers via USB. Yeah, that's actually a huge advantage. So uh, the Rode NTG, it basically has the preamp built into it. Is that correct? Because it can be used as a USB mic with your computer? Yep, it's a digital uh, digital microphone basically it has on Oh, board. so everything is just digital then? Well, it, it has the preamp on board, right? So it's taking that, you know, rather than only out- outputting an audio signal. Ah, uh, okay, right, right, right. That's it's analog. Converting yep, it it's converting it actually to a digital signal. So, so it, it is basically built in. Yeah, so, I mean, at $250, that's pretty much... Uh, that's a game changer because we're using mics right now the nt1 those are 270 and they can really only be used in the studio and the microphone i got i think it's the sennheiser mke 600 yeah i think that's the name of it let me see what i paid for that but yeah you have a that's a shotgun microphone this is a shotgun microphone for 330 dollars so already i'm up to two microphones costing oh my god if i spent over 500 dollars on microphones and I have the Zoom H5. Oh, my God. Well, but this is what we're showing. Audio is actually a good thing to invest your money in. This is the wrong reaction. You should be excited that you invested that much in <laughs> Yay. audio gear. I'm just bummed the Rode NTG wasn't out sooner. Like, that would potentially be able to replace the NT1, and it would be a shotgun mic. And, it, oh, my God, because the Shure VP83 was another two. Have I spent almost $1,000 right, okay. on... Well, let sets in uh, spiral in his existential dread of uh, money habits and stuff over there. But I do think the you know the video mic NTG potentially is too much for some people. Rode also has their video micro, which, and I'm sure other companies have similar ones to this. Um, I don't think Sennheiser has any, but there definitely are some out there. I just, we talk about Rode a lot, mainly because they offer, you know, five to 10 year warranties on most of the products which is just proof that they really stand behind them uh and so the video micro is a great one for vloggers or that on-camera microphone because it's only 80 dollars, so it's not a huge you know commitment price wise uh, and it's so small that you can easily throw it in a bag with your camera uh but then if you need better audio just pop it on board and it's not you know not you know premium like film quality audio but it's definitely going to be better than your camera even the, uh, I think Rode makes just a lav mic that plugs directly into your iPhone and you can't even use the voice memos app worth. Uh, that is even better audio. And um, yeah, audio is just so important. And, you know, as Gabe mentioned, I think actually it's a good thing I've been investing so much in audio because in my opinion, it's actually made my videos uh, better and it helps engage the audience because they can hear you, they know what you're talking about and uh, your voice sounds really good. So yeah, I think... If I were to to make any recommendations for people, if you're doing voiceover work, get a cardioid condenser microphone, look into one of those. If you're doing run and gun type stuff, Rode NTG could be great or the Rode VideoMic Pro or basically uh, your shotgun or uh, hot shoe mounted shotgun microphone that, that are out there. Those are going to be great. And my thing for unboxings, I actually want to get a lav mic specifically for unboxings so I don't have a huge, clunky microphone and mic arm in the way when I'm trying to unbox the, the a product. The only thing, though, as we as we saw from uh, the mic test, it's definitely a lower quality than your, you know... It's true. ...than your standard, you know, large diaphragm condenser or shotgun microphone. So you are decreasing in quality. But the one thing I would add is I didn't really do... I didn't actually do no EQing or any, you know, post-processing with those audio clips... So the standard thing with a lav mic is you generally have to boost the you know the highs a little bit because it t- tends to have a lot of bass and be a little muffled. So you know you boost the highs a little bit, add a little compressor, and it cleans it up pretty good. Yeah, I guess each mic kind of has their their own forte, what they're good at. Um, with the NTG kind of trying to be, excuse me, I, I guess it's the Rode Video Mic NTG yep. trying to be the jack of all trades. And I guess uh, the last thing I wanted to comment on. Uh, is the lav mic is the only omnidirectional mic that was in that comparison. Everything else was a directional microphone. So that is true. An interesting and, tidbit. And also, uh, if you are looking for, you know, a condenser, large diaphragm condenser microphone, starting out with a USB microphone, while it's not, you know, going to be as good quality as investing in, you know, an audio interface like, you know, the Focusrite 2i2 or getting a recorder like a Tascam or a Zoom, a 
USB microphone is still going to be a lot better quality than anything else you have. And it's, I mean, I still have a USB microphone just because it's so easy to plug in quickly uh, and get good audio uh, versus, yeah, you know, getting a whole setup. So I would definitely, you know, don't, don't think, oh, I have to save up to only get the pro setup. I don't have to be like Stetson and, and drop a thousand dollars on five different microphones. Right, exactly. And a lot of, uh, like, I think I talked about, what was it? The, well, I can't remember the name of the microphone I talked about earlier, but the AKG, I think it was the Lyra USB microphone. Ones like that or the Blue Yeti um, is going to have the ability to have actually multi pattern pickups. So you can actually, on those microphones, select between, you know, your standard cardioid, switch to an omnidirectional, switch to a figure eight pattern, which is good for setting the microphone in the table and, you know, doing an interview between two people. Um, and I think they even have a couple other ones, but yeah, they're, it's something that you don't get on your, your more professional microphones, but is great for, you know, someone starting out for streaming, content creating, beginner musicians, stuff like that. Gabe, that sounds like a wrap. That's our audio episode. Sounds like a wrap as in I should put a beat to it. Yeah. We should get a, a nice rhyming. outro beat music like going on. This is the mic. Record it right. Turn your audio levels so they hit the decibel. Oh, all right. That yeah, that, all hard. right. That's it. Thank you guys so much for listening, guys and girls. So much for listening. Yeah. Uh, uh, and also, can... hopefully you found this helpful. You know, this is kind of the first really deep dives we've done since I think how to get started on YouTube we did last year. So, yeah, I think you're right, Gabe. Yeah, that was a while ago. This is yes. kind of like the audio only version of that. Yeah, this is, well, not only YouTube, though, this is also, you know, applicable for podcasting. Yeah, podcasting, you know, starting, you know, music studio, uh, recording, you know, songs, stuff like that. Whatever form of content you're trying to create, audio is a huge component, potentially the only component if you're doing podcasting. But, you know, definitely is important to get good gear, but it's also not everything. Content is king. So, you know, work, I guess, a little harder on, you know, improving the quality of your podcast. Uh, and then just upgrade the mic when you have the you know the money or you're seeing all right uh, this microphone literally sounds like garbage maybe I should, really should uh, you know upgrade it. Content is king, but equipment certainly helps out. So you can find us at Pinch to Zoom Podcast, actually at Pinch to Zoom Pod on Twitter, at Pinch to Zoom Podcast on Instagram, and uh, email us Pinch to Zoom Podcast at gmail dot com. We'd love to. Get your questions, hear your comments. Yeah, check out um, check so, out the new website, pinchtozoompodcast.com. Stefan just set that up. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Check it out. Uh, we've got all the latest episodes on there um, and tons of great info as well. So that's going to wrap up this episode. I'm Stetson. I'm Gabe. And we look forward to talking to you in the next episode. I don't know. Do I cut that out or do I leave that in? I don't know. It, you know, it's interesting. I feel like I kind of start the episode and I end the episode. Do you want to start the episode? See, sometimes you need bread on either side of a sandwich, but what are people actually liking? The stuff in oh, the middle. Oh, God. Gabe. <laughs> That's me. Well, you know, I was I was getting some hints because of your mic test A, B, C, D, and E. Yeah. Uh, they kind of indicated you may be interested in starting the episode. <laughs> what? <laughs> why, would you, why would you think that? <laughs> <laughs>